Okay, um, in the first video in this series, I introduced the idea of subjectivism along with Sartre. Right? Basically, we choose and make ourselves, and um, <coughs> in addition to that, um, do, 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 on the other hand, it's impossible to transcend human subjectivity. Uh, there's an important caveat to this. Right? Um, clearly, from what we've seen from Sartre, right, it, this kind of subjectivism is not a solipsism, right? It's, it's not a position that, 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 that basically we are strong ego subjects that are radically distinct from one another and choosing ourselves, we choose all of mankind and we always choose in the landscape of other people. He introduces this notion on page 38 um, as um, intersubjectivity, he states, top of the page, the other is indispensable to my own existence, as well as to my knowledge about myself. This being so, in discovering my inner being, I also discover the other person at the same time, like a freedom placed in front of me which thinks and wills only for or against me. Hence, let us announce the discovery of a world which we call intersubjectivity, that is the world in which man decides what he and what others are. Besides, it's impossible to find in every man some universal essence which, we would, uh, 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 which would be human nature. Yet there does exist a universal human condition. It's not by chance that today's thinkers speak more readily of man's condition than of his nature. By condition, they mean more or less definitely the a priori limits which outline man's fundamental situation in the universe. So effectively, what existentialism does by, you know, suggesting that we have a condition rather than a nature is to maintain sort of a sphere of freedom, right? If we have a nature, then we can never be anything but what we are, right? There's, there's a field called transhumanism right now, right, where we're in, and what they mean is something biological by it. We're actually in the process technologically now of actually choosing a lot of the features of our existence that normally have been sort of natural, right? We can choose gender, right? We can choose to uh, overcome certain limitations, either through neuropharmacological means or by genetic means, etc., etc., etc. A lot of the things that would have been set in us, right, are now up for grabs. We can overcome uh, sort of the natural limitations that we're born with technologically in some sort of sense. What the existentialists mean is something sort of deeper than that. We find ourselves, yes, as certain kinds of beings, right, of a particular height, weight, gender, that sort of thing in the world, but nonetheless, none of these things have any sort of meaning unless we live them and give them that meaning. Right? So what gender means, what our natural limitations mean, what it means to be white or male or a person of color or female or Canadian or American or what have you, these are things that we choose and define ourselves in terms of. We, we choose what the meaning of these features are. Sartre continues here. Historical situations vary. Man, be bo man may be born a slave in a pagan society or a feudal lo lord or totalitarian. What does not vary is the necessity for him to exist in the world, to be at work there to be there in the midst of other people and to be moral there. These limits are neither subjective nor objective, or rather they have an objective and a subjective side. Objective because they're to be found everywhere and are recognizable everywhere. Right? So, no, what, no matter what a person's situation is, we recognize these features of human existence that everybody is dealing with. Whether you're a slave in an Egyptian society millennia ago, or, you know, really somebody sitting on the street of Detroit and, and, and panhandling today, effectively, right, 
you are human, you are mortal, you're amongst other people, you're at work, and that's the situation. Right? But when we configure ourselves to engage with the realities of our own existence, that is, however, up to us. Right? So, objective because they're to be found everywhere and are re recognizable everywhere, and subjective because they are lived and are nothing if man does not live them, that is, freely determine his existence with reference to them. And though the configurations may differ, at least none of them are completely strange to me because they all appear as attempts to either pass beyond these limits or recede from them or to not deny them or adapt them. Consequently, every configuration, however individual it may be, has a universal value. So effectively, what Sartre is arguing here is something interesting and might actually you know, establish the basis for the possibility of empathy. It seems that the kind of subjectivism that goes into existentialism is absolutely individuating. Right? He seems to call question to community and shared values and history and historicity and all of that. Right? But at the same time, on the basis of our shared humanity, that is, right, to be thrown into the world as human beings in a human situation, right, wherein we choose and we act in the context of these human realities, our moralness, sharing the world with other people, etc., etc., etc. Nobody, nothing is completely foreign to me. Right? And if I, if I treat human situations as though they are completely foreign, that's a choice that I have made. Right? So, it, it's a fascinating aspect of Sartre's position here, right? Um, it, he continues on the bottom of 39. In this sense, we may say that there is a universality of men, but it is not given. It's perpetually being made. I build the universal in choosing myself. I build in understanding the configuration of every other man, whatever age he might have lived in. This absoluteness of choice does not do away with uh, the, re uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the relativeness of each epoch. At heart, what existentialism shows is the connection between the absolute character of free involvement, involvement by virtue of which every man realizes himself in realizing a type of mankind, an involvement always comprehensible in every age whatsoever, and by any person whosoever, and that the relativeness of the cultural ensemble which may result from such a choice. It must be stressed that uh, <clears throat> the relativity of uh, Cartesianism um, and the absolute character of Cartesian involvement go together. In this sense, you may, if you like, say that each of us performs an absolute act in breathing, eating, sleeping, or behaving in any way whatsoever. There is no dif difference between being free, like a configuration, like an existence which chooses its essence, and absolute, uh, being absolute. There is no difference between being an absolute temporality localized, that is, localized in history, and being universally comprehensible. All right? So, effectively, what Sartre is saying here is that in each and every epoch, whether we've got iPhones or cups and strings or smoke signals or, you know, horses or trains or steam engines or jetpacks or hoverboards or whatever, right? None of it really fundamentally changes what we're dealing with is with free beings who are creating themselves and creating mankind through each and every one of their choices. We all deal with the same sort of human situation differently, right? Culturally, individually, even within the context of a culture, there's a great degree of variation, but nonetheless, the human binds us, right? And
it, this is the basis of a kind of condition that lays the framework for an intersubjectivity. This is why existentialism is not solipsistic. Right? We exist in a world with one another as beings that are trying to make sense of their lives in the same kind of way. We are freedom. We are nothing but our freedom. We are nothing until we choose an act. Right? So, effectively, right, uh, there's this objection to existentialism that's probably in the back of your mind and Sartre wants to address it here, right? And um, it, it, the objection reads, and he introduces it on 441, you're able to do anything no matter what, right? It, this, is, this is the argument that, well, if ethics is subjectivized in this way, and if we really are anxious, forlorn, and despair, in, in despair the way that Sartre is talking about, how how do we come up with any sort of position in which we can share an ethic, right? Your values are not true in a sense insofar as they stem from your subjectivity and you choose them, right? How do, how do we judge anyone? How, how can such a morality bind us together in any sort of real way, right? There are no objective moral values is what Sartre is arguing here. Right. Well, his response is interesting, right? um, and in his response, right, he compares ethics to art. And I'll just read the passage quickly here, it's 42 over to 43. May I ask whether anyone has ever accused an artist who has painted a picture of not having drawn his inspiration from rules set up a priori? Has anyone ever asked what painting ought he make? It's clearly understood that there are no definite, um, uh, definite, uh, that there is no definite painting to be made that, and uh, uh, do, 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 uh, to be made that the artist is engaged in the making of his painting, and that the painting to be made is precisely the painting he will have made. It is clearly understood that there are no a priori aesthetic values, but that there are values which appear subsequently in the coherence of the painting in a correspondence between the art of what the artist intended and the result. Nobody can tell what the painting of tomorrow will be like. Painting can be judged only after it has once been made. What connection does this have with ethics? We're in the same creative situation. We never say that a work of art is arbitrary. When we speak of the canvas of Picasso, we never say that it is arbitrary. We understand quite well that he was making himself what he is at the very time he was painting, and that the ensemble of his work is embodied in his life. The same holds on the ethical plane. What art and ethics have in common is that we have creation and invention in both cases. We can not decide a priori what there is to be done. I think I've pointed that out quite sufficiently when I mentioned the case of my student who came to see me and who might have applied um, to all ethical systems, Kantian or otherwise, without getting any sort of guidance. He was, ne he was obliged to devise his law himself. Never let it be said about this man who, taking affection, individual action, and kind-heartedness towards a specific person, as his ethical first principle chooses to remain with his mother, or who, preferring to make a sacrifice, chooses to go to England, has made an arbitrary choice. This is an example from earlier in the book about a student who comes to see Sartre asking for some sort of advice. All right? He's gone to see a priest, but he chose what which priest to go see. He's applied a Kantian ethical th system, but insofar as it's generalist, he still has to make a choice in a particular case. This is what I was talking about. Simpler example, you ever flip a coin, agree to abide by uh, the result of a coin flip, it comes up tails, and you choose to do what the coin tells you to do. You haven't avoided the fact that you've chosen. Effectively, you've just sort of randomized and that sort of thing. All you've done is show that your disposition to that choice is weak when you flip a coin. Even if you flip a coin and say, I'll leave it up to chance, you've chosen to leave it up to chance and you're still responsible for that choice. Right? You see, there's no wiggling it away from it here. So effectively, 
when we are in situations, we are, as Sartre has introduced, doomed to choose. We're doomed to choose. The only thing we cannot choose is not to choose. For even not making a choice, you ever throw up your hands and say, I'm just not choosing in this situation. That's a choice. There's no way out of it here. We're doomed. We're stuck. Right? Effectively, this puts us in the same situation as an artist. Right? The values that emerge as a result of our choices and our actions, they're not arbitrary. They come from somewhere. Right? And they have a cohesiveness right? and a substance that actually asserts itself through their choosing. Right? The same way the artist's choices in making a work of art make the work of art a meaningful, substantial sort of thing. Right? So Sartre um, continues, man makes himself, he isn't ready-made from the start. In choosing his ethics, he makes himself. And force of circumstance is, that, uh, is such that he cannot abstain from choosing one. We define man only in relationship to involvement. It is therefore absurd to charge us with arbitrariness of choice. Right? And then he continues here, we are able to pass judgment on others. Right? The first kind of judgment that he introduces right, is maybe not a judgment of value, but rather a logical judgment. In 44 he points out, the first that one can judge that certain choices are based on error and others on truth. If we have defined man's situation as a free choice with no excuses and no recourse. Every man who takes refuge, uh, refuge behind the excuse of his passions, every man who sets up a determinism, is a dishonest man. The objection may be raised, but why mayn't, uh, mayn't he choose himself dishonestly? I reply that I'm not obliged to pass moral judgment on him, but that I do define his dishonesty as an error. Right. Secondly, right, on 45, he lays out another way that we can pass judgment. Besides, I can bring a moral judgment to bear when I declare that freedom is, in every concrete circumstance, uh, 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 that freedom in every uh, concrete circumstance can have no other aim than to want itself. If man has once become aware that in his forlornness, he in, in imposes values he can no longer want but one thing, and that is freedom, as the basis of all of his values. That doesn't mean that he wants it in the abstract. He wants it, it means simply that the ultimate meaning of the acts of an honest man in his quest for freedom as such, a man who belongs to a communist or a revolutionary union, wants concrete goals. These goals imply an abstract desire for freedom, but this freedom is wanted in something concrete. We want freedom for freedom's sake and in every particular circumstance. And in wanting freedom, we discover that it depends entirely on the freedom of others and that the freedom of others depends on ours. Of course, freedom as the definition of man does not depend on others, but as soon as there is involvement, I am obliged to want others to have freedom at the same time as I want my own freedom. I <clears throat> can take freedom as my goal only if I take that of others as a goal as well, consequently. When, in all honesty, I have recognized that man is a being in whom existence precedes essence, that he is a free being who, in various circumstances, can want only his freedom. I have at the same time recognized that I can want only the freedom of others. Therefore, in the named freedom, uh, the name of this, uh, this will for freedom, which freedom itself implies, I may pay it past judgment on those who seek to hide from their, themselves the complete arbitrariness and the complete freedom of their existence. Those who hide their complete freedom from themselves out of a spirit of seriousness or by means of deterministic excuses, I shall call cowards. Those who try to show 
that their existence was necessary. One, it's very con uh, when it is the very contingency of man's appearance on earth. I call stinkers, but cowards or stinkers can be judged only from a strictly unbiased uh, point of view. Therefore, though the content of ethics is variable, a certain form of it is universal. Kant says that freedom desires both itself and the freedom of others, granted. But he believes that the formal and the universal are enough to constitute an ethics. We, on the other hand, think that principles which are too abstract run aground in trying to decide action. Once again, take the case of that student right, who came. I mean, effectively, what Sartre is arguing for here is an ethics of involvement. And the basis of his judgment, I've got a silly example for you, and I'll conclude with this example. Star Wars, if you're a Star Wars fan, specifically the original trilogy, the only one that really matters, and the middle one from the original trilogy, The Empire Strikes Back. Who's on the ship? C-3PO. Han, Leia. Escaping from uh, the Star Destroyers, Boba Fett high on their uh, trail and that sort of thing, and they decide to go to see Lando at Cloud City. They land, uh, and Lando is there, and they'd be hitting on Leia and saying, I've just struck a deal that will keep the Empire out of our business for good. Sounds like a good deal. Except in so far as the door opens, the stormtroopers and Boba Fett step out, and Darth Vader is there. Right? What does L and Lando say immediately after that? It's not my fault. They arrived just before you got here. I had no choice. And it's that moment where he becomes a villain. He just demonstrates that he is a villain, and he is a villain for these existential reasons. It's not my fault. Who else's fault is it? I had no choice. Bull. Bull. It was all his choice. We always have choices. This is the sense in which he is a villain. I had no fault. Or it, it's not my fault. I had no choice. Is him trying to wiggle out of his freedom. I know it's a silly example. It's just silly. But nonetheless, Lando Calrissian is the epitome of Sartian bad faith. And we can pass that kind of judgment. First off, he's an heir. I, it's not my fault. I had no choice. False. False. And further than that, it becomes bad faith once we realize that in valuing his own freedom, he necessarily has to value the freedom of others. Right. So, that's Sartian ethics, right? um, and it's all based purely on this tension between freedom and responsibility. If you want the freedom, you got to have the responsibility. Right? It's an interesting position. It engages emotionally and not rationally and purely dispassionately. And um, I hope you have got something from it. Right? We are nothing but our choices. We are nothing but our actions. So most of the ways that we define ourselves are bad faith. Right? I'm the instructor for this class. I'm a philosopher. I'm a husband. I am a father. I am a son. I am a Canadian, etc., etc., etc. There is no reality to any one of those statements unless we choose and we act. I'm the professor for this course, that's true, insofar as I act like the professor for this course. There's no reality other than that. You're students insofar as you are students. Think of it in terms of a relationship. You don't have a relationship unless both people in the relationship act like there's a relationship. There's no reality except in action and in action that depends on our will and our choices according to Sartre. Alright, thank you. Have good days, one for each of you.